Okay, so thank you for the testimonials. Um, as you know, we're in the biblical story. We're going to be going through the book of Luke and keep the prayer requests uh, up to date. We're all uh, eagerly waiting for those and keep those in your prayers. Thank you for doing those for us. Thank you. Now, as I give you a overview of what's been going on, uh, I'm going to tell you that we talked about the Sermon on the Mount that upended everybody's uh, common thinking that was in Judaism of that day, which is loving your enemies was unheard of from that standpoint. And Jesus says, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you so that you may be sons of your father in heaven. So that was a shocking statement and hard to believe. And then very next part of chapter seven was a very unlikely person fulfills the Sermon on the Mount. The enemy of the Jewish people, a centurion, humbles himself before Jesus and his servant is healed. And he demonstrates all the points of a believing person that God would love for people to fulfill the Sermon on the Mount, and he humbles himself and requires God's mercy and forgiveness and his actions and dependence on him and humility. So that was a, a stark example of the fulfillment of that. And then we did the next part of chapter seven was the widow of Nain with a son dead and having a hopeless future. And Jesus comes on the scene, raises him from the dead, and presents him back to his mother. Then we talked about John the Baptist, who went from a life out in the wilderness with um, outdoors, and now he's locked up in a prison and he's asking Jesus. Uh, are you the one, or should we look for another? Whether he was doubting, whether he was asking questions, uh, Jesus says to him, to, to the disciples, to go send him back to John, tell him what you've seen and heard. And then he goes, the blind get sight, the hearing hear, the poor have the gospel preached to them, right? Remember, when Jesus... Um, announced his ministry in his hometown. He takes Isaiah and he reads Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, press go free, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is a shocking statement to that crowd. And even more shocking, he goes, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And what does his hometown do after his reception? They want to throw him off the cliff. And it says he could do no great miracles there because of their unbelief. And then we talked about the difference between doubt, where it's negative, and asking questions as of, I have faith, but I just don't understand this. And the best illustration of that was Mary asking questions how could these things be? I don't know a man. And if she doesn't get punished for that or go mute. Whereas Zacharias says, you're going to have a son and name him John. And when he asks questions, he can't talk because God says, It'll, since you didn't believe me, it will be fulfilled when your son is born and his tongue is open when he said his name shall be John after he's born. And then we talked about People in the Bible who had moments of doubt or great despair that they wanted to die. We talked about Moses when he complained about uh, wanting to die. And we talked about Elijah after his big mount uh, experience, mountaintop experience. He wants to die in the wilderness and an angel strengthens him. And then after all that, we read about James that says, you know, people like Moses and Elijah, they're in a tear all of themselves. I could never even promote, approach those people. And then it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. 
And what did he do? He prayed earnestly. It would rain and it didn't rain. So these were not superhuman people. They were just used by God. He talked about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who also wanted to die in his difficulty and discouragement, as of course, so did Job lamented the day of his birth. Paul despaired and said, um, I felt like we had the sentence of death on us, and the only hope I had was that Jesus raises the dead, so if I die, I die, sort of like Thomas, remember? And Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem, and the disciples go, so can you go to Jerusalem? Don't you know they're not feeling there? And Thomas goes, well, let's go with them. We're going to all die with them. Let's go. I mean, guess we're going to die. So it's like you're despaired of death. And it said that in verse. We talked about what you would feel like if we were in a wrath, loss of sea like this guy for hundreds of days. What would be the one thing that would give you hope that kept you alive through that experience and it's being rescued, right? So we talked about what is our hope? So Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we said, faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. And, you know, me and the scientific background, everything I learn about, I see it, I can explain it, and it's all physical. But this is not that. This is see, not believing something you can't prove or see. And then we talked about that famous saying that Jesus said that, you know what you guys are like, you religious leaders, you are like a children playing in the marketplace. Once they play a dirge and you don't play along and mourn, then we play the wedding feast joy song and then you don't dance. It's like John the Baptist comes with this mournful repentance and you don't believe in him. I come with this wedding feast and giving you all these things and you don't you don't follow him. You're like spoiled kids. You won't play the game, right? So we talked about the wedding and the funeral song. And it was in Luke 7, he said, shall I like this generation? What are they like? They're like children in the marketplace calling to one another. We piped and you didn't dance, we mourned and you did not eat. He said, who played the funeral song? And it was John the Baptist. He played the austere repentance, brokenness message, even though the same, it was the same message, but that's what he was like with the Nazarite vow, living in the wilderness. He said, who played the wedding song? And of course, Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and eating with them and celebrating. And why are you such a glutton and messing with those sinners? And then we talked about Jesus who mentions, let me show you what the Father's like. If there is one sinner who repents, there is joy in heaven. And if there's one lost sheep who leaves the 99 to go to the other and get him, and then he has a celebration. And then I like this part of the verse that says, John the Baptist, who show you a where that came from, came neither eating bread or drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. I, Jesus, the son of man, using Daniel's title of Messiah. I come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton, wine bigger, friend of tax collectors and sinners. And they also call him a demon, too, by the way. And he did things by demons. And he goes, wisdom is justified by your children. So we saw the message was, whether it was a funeral or wedding, you didn't believe, dirge, celebration, isolation, public, you concluded, you concluded both have a demon. And we said, John called for a fast, you rejected him. Jesus called for a feast, you rejected him. John said the kingdom was a fire, you rejected him. And I said the kingdom is a festival, and you rejected me. And they were like, Brats are fools, void of true wisdom, known by the patriots for the true criticism of the style of ministry, and the children of wisdom were saved and known by their righteousness. And then we said, um, in Paul, it was talking about those who have violated their conscience and their faith has been shipwrecked. And that was going on even after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. 
And so what comes right after the children in the marketplace parable in the book of Matthew, it was judgment where he upends Cariza, Capernaum, and said it'll be greater for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you at Tyre and Sidon. So that was what was waiting for them for their rejection. And he said, by the way, John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp that I sent. You enjoy the light for a little while, but then when he got thrown in prison and all that, you ultimately rejected him too. And so there was John in prison and never to be seen again after that moment because he was beheaded and he was in the Machairis prison of Herod's palace, which would have looked like this and looks like this now. And so you mentioned that the Pharisees were similar to which prophet in the Old Testament who didn't want God's mercy, grace, forgiveness for their enemies. You remember? It was Jonah, and Jonah lost his temper and said, the reason I ran away is I know you're a merciful God and you would have forgiven those Ninevites and I don't want you to give, forgive them because they're my enemy for half of the Sermon on the Mount. That's what you do do to your enemy, right? So Jesus, John the Baptist, came to the same conclusion about the Pharisees. What was their famous words for them? What did he call them? You brood of vipers, you snakes, right? So that was John the Baptist. Here's Jesus. And it says, Woe to you, teachers, law, Pharisees, hypocrites, snakes, brood of vipers. How will you escape the condemnment, condemnation to come? Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven and you don't go yourselves and you keep others from going. So the word scathing was given to them. They were called all of these names, right? And what did Jesus think of the generation that he came in? He said, oh, you faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I put up with you? That's pretty bad, isn't it? And Acts says with Paul and with many other than Peter, with other words, Peter solemnly testified and kept exhorting them, saying, be saved from this, what? Perverse generation. And what does Paul say in Philippians? So you may be blameless, pure children of God without fault in what? A crooked and perverse generation. And what are you going to do in that perverse generation? You're going to shine as lights in the world, right? Now we go to today's message. This is the message of today. And you can see um, the picture speaks a thousand words. And we're going to talk about the characters in this lesson. So here we go. Go to Luke 7, verse 36, if you're not there. It says that one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Now, that was at least a good gesture that a Pharisee is asking Jesus to come eat. So Jesus didn't just go with tax collectors. He actually goes with the Pharisee. He obviously could have had bad intention, but at least he invited him. So he asked them to eat, and then he went to the Pharisee's house. He sat down to eat. And then um, in those days, you would eat with your doors and windows open. People would know Jesus is there. There's a crowd. And people would, would sort of sit in the periphery in the dark area and watch what's going on and listen in. Okay, so it's not like this is a crazy, someone's walking into my kitchen and I didn't even fight kind of thing. But it is shocking that how it happens. If this, this is a shocking statement. If you were there and you had your mentality, you're trying to put yourself in their shoes and what they think of people, you know everybody in your town who's like, obviously publicly doing bad things and others who look religiously and they look like they're good but they don't really know the part and then it says behold a woman in the city who was a sinner which means she's a prostitute she knew that jesus sat in the table in, in the pharisee's house she brings an alabaster flask of fragrant oil she stood at his feet behind him and they're not like sitting in a table chairs like we are just sort of reclining with their dirty feet away from the table okay stood at his feet behind him weeping 
and she's washing his feet with her tears. Now, just picture this and what you would think about this. This prostitute, is, is the guest of honor, is having tears on his feet, and she's washing them with her hair. He wipes, she then she kisses his feet, okay? And then anoints them with fragrant oil. Now, what do you think you would have thought? Well, let's see what the Pharisee thought. Now, when the Pharisee who invited him and saw this, he spoke within himself, and Jesus obviously knows your thoughts and his, and he goes, this man, this Jesus who I invited, he's supposed to be this big prophet. If he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is and who's touching them, for she's a sinner. So if, it, if this happened to him, he would have kicked her away and get away from me, right? And Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus said, and now here's how Jesus loved to teach. He doesn't say, look, Simon, there's evil in your heart for thinking that thought. He goes, Simon, let me show you a little analogy, and then he's going to convict himself with his answer. That's the beauty of Jesus dealing with these people. So Jesus answers, says to Simon, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then Simon's thinking, okay, this is an awkward situation. What am I going to answer? Because this, he's going to tell me something maybe that I don't want to hear. So he goes, teacher, say it. Let's hear it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, which was um, two and a half years wages. Another owed 50, two and a half months wages. Okay, that's the, here's the parable. Two and a half years Two and a half months. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, said, Well, let me think. You're going to trick me with this? I suppose the one who he forgave more. He said to him, You have rightly judged. That is the correct answer. Now let's put the application in there. Now you answer the question. You have just indicted yourself. And now let me tell you the application. He turned to the woman and he said, to Simon, you see this woman here? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She's washed my feet with her tears. You gave me no towel to wipe them off. She wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. So if you were coming to my house, and I wanted to show you honor. I would kiss you on the cheek, and then the other cheek. I would wash your feet, wipe them off. None of that happened. But this woman did it. Okay. And then the fourth thing: you didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. His feet smell bad, and I got this aroma now. My feet have been washed. Right. Therefore, here's the shocking statement: I say to you. This is like, this is the dad like right in here. It's like, I can't believe you're saying this. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven because she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. That's shocking, by the way. And by the way, if you go to commentaries that aren't really spiritually based and biblically based, what are you going to assume by that statement? Why did she get her sins forgiven? Because she loved a lot, right? Who's getting all the credit? The woman. So that means if I love a lot, I will have my sins forgiven. So I need to work for God's love. That is not what it's saying. It's not saying that at all. All right? Those who sat at the table with him, Pharisees have fellow Pharisees, tax collectors, or excuse me, lawyers, Scribes, who is this who even forgives sin? He says to the woman, Your faith has saved you, go in peace. Now, what saved the woman based on the last verse? Faith. Your faith. It didn't say your love or anything, it said your faith. Go in peace. So here's the woman doing all those things, and there's the shocking. Uh, Pharisees looking at this and are unbelievable. 
So what are the three things Simon failed to do for Jesus? We went over it, right? What were they? No water for the feet, no kiss of greeting, no oil for head. He's the one who owes two months wages because why? He didn't love much. She owed two and a half years. And it's because in his mind, I'm not a sinner. I don't need your forgiveness. I don't need anything. I'm just self-righteous, right? That's his, that's the analogy, right? And then the Pharisee was judging Jesus. He comes to the wrong conclusion. He doesn't understand grace, common theme. And he has these mixed ideas about Jesus. What are the three things we know the, the woman that contrasted with Simon's behavior? She owes two years of wages and she loves much because her debt is so great and she comes in brokenness and gets this big debt forgiven. She washes feet with tears, dries with her hair, kisses his feet, anoints with perfume, right? She previously lived an immoral life. So remember when Jesus was accosted by the woman who committed adultery, he goes, you are forgiven, now go sin no more. So you assume they break their lifestyle, although they're still sinners, right? So this was um, the breaking of her lifestyle, potentially. She was still living with the stigma. She was clearly repentant remorseful. She heard Jesus was at the house. She anoints him with oil, and she's overcome with gratitude and love. What was the contrast with the other actions of the woman and Simon and their inner heart? So we saw the external, but Jesus saw the inside, which is where the real lesson is, right? That's where the lesson is. So what did you notice about him? The host, Simon, gets no water. She gets tears. The host, this is all external, gave no towel. She gave her hair. The host gives no kiss. She keeps kissing his feet. The host gives no cheap oil to get the bad smell away. She pours expensive perfume. Now, why does Jesus forgive the woman and not Simon? Because the woman had faith in Jesus and that he was go able to forgive her sins, to ask for her forgiveness and her brokenness. And Simon did not see a need for forgiving his sin, right? I love this little package verse, don't you? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, a famous memory verse. For by grace are you saved. What is grace? Remember the definition, what's grace? Unmerited favor. What's the acronym grace stand for? If you'd like to remember that. Thank you. You are correct. Did you hear what Robert said? God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. Great memory verse. When you're trying to talk about that grace, are you saved? How is that happening? Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. You accept the gift. You don't say, here's some money to pay for it. You just say, thank you. I don't deserve it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then what's the next verse we never quote? Anybody? The next verse. Where you are created unto good works. Because God created it for your workmanship. So there is works, but notice the right place of the works. Okay, grace, or you say, through faith, unto good works, not works plus salvation, not works. So that verse has the whole testimony of the truth of the gospel, right? So what was Jesus' role in the story in the parable? So we just did Simon, we did the woman, what about Jesus? Jesus is obviously God. That's why they're shocked that he can forgive sins because he's saying, I'm God. He acknowledges her many sins. He acknowledges her love because he can see the heart. He also sees Simon's heart, doesn't see great love. Jesus publicly pronounces forgiveness. You're forgiven to everybody so you can hear. I have the power to do that. The people wonder about how can you do that? You're either blasting me or you're God. And they acknowledge the woman's faith. Now, when I taught this, I took my son to Lowe's. And as I'm coming out, there's a woman with a two-year-old. 
with a sign that says, I am needy. So as I was walking by, I was thinking, do I just ignore her? <laughs> and so I take out my wallet and I give her three bucks, right? And then as I get to my car, I think, why didn't you give her 20 bucks or something? Like, and I thought, wow, you know, did I love little because I shaped her little? And I'm like, what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn? And it's like, I understand, I don't want to get into the debate of giving people money and they don't do bad things with it. But, you know, the point is, what is your heart? It's like, God, is this the path and I just failed it? Or did I get a C minus? What does what does I, I didn't want to fire? It's like, you know, I asked myself, what is the application? So anyway, that's for me to worry about, not you, but it's just a thought. Okay? So how is love and forgiveness related? She loves much, and you was forgiven much, but it's really not about her love. It's about love, right? It says to you, and this is, these are the verses with love and forgiveness together. It says uh, in the verses 47, I say to you, her sins are many and are forgiven because she loved much. That's not why she assumes the faith. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. So John 3.16 is implied, why did Jesus die on the cross? To forgive us of our sins. But he also did it because why? He loved us that much, and God the Father sent him. And John 3.16 says, how much did God love us? God so loved the world, he gave his own, one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I like this one, of course. Greater love has no man than this, that a man went down his life for his friends, giving your own self. Listen to these verses that have forgiveness and love together. The Lord is slow and steadfast love. And here's the next word. Forgiving iniquity and transcription. I know Second Corinthians puts it together and says, He's caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this is someone who sinned and now he's repenting of his sin and he's coming back to the church. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Here's what you should do to him that has repented and come back to the church. You should re rather turn you forgive and comfort him. He may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. And here it is. I beg you to what? Reaffirm your love for him. There's the love forgiveness. Anyone who you forgive, I also forgive. So that was Paul of the Corinthians. Now, one of you is, or many of you are probably saying, was Mary of Bethany the sinful woman who anointed Jesus? Yes or no? Mary, Martha, Lazarus, no. was it? No. It was not. But a lot of people are confused because it's very similar. There was Simon the Tanner at her house was at, and then with Simon the Pharisee, but Simon was a common word, right? That was not the same story. Remember what happened in that story in John? Mary takes costly ointment of nard, anoints the feet of Jesus, and wipes her feet with her hair. And then what does, um, who complains? Judas. Who complains? Judas Iscariot. What did the other disciples say or think? The same thing. They were in the same one. But what does John say about it that tells you the heart of Judas? What does John say? He said, but he didn't care about the poor. He wanted to steal the money. <laughs> that what John said will do. Okay, after the fact, right? So Jesus said to Simon, Jesus said to Simon and Barry, you know your story to rebuke him, but you say what he does by the story, right? And then what does he tell Judas and the disciples to Mary, Lazarus' sister and Martha's sister? He goes, leave her alone. Let her keep this for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. So the anointing of Jesus has a lot of similarities with 
this humility, this woman, Mary versus the sinner, different person, the hair, the head, the oil, the complaint by somebody in the audience, and similar but not the same story. So, reacting to Mary's behavior, similar to Simon's behavior, and Jesus' actions of the woman and rebukes both Judas and Simon. So remember, Judas, Judas, something clicks in his brain and he says, this is going to go for disaster for me and I can't get what I want out of this relationship, so I'm getting out of here. And it says the very next thing Judas does is he goes to the chief priest to betray Jesus. When that event happened, that was the final straw for him. And Jesus says, leave her alone, you have the poor always. And this is where it says he's taking the money out of it. So, not to dwell on it, but the four Gospels have all these stories in there, but they're totally different. And this is an example of each point on how they're similar and different, and I won't go over it. So, let me conclude by saying this. Jesus, in irony, reaches out to demonstrate his power to forgive sins to a hypocritical, self-righteous Pharisee by using the very person the Pharisee despised the most, a low-life, reprobate, wretched, immoral prostitute, whose transformation was very clear and inarguable. This he uses as evidence of his power to transform him into Pharisee. And so Jesus had Mary Magdalene, who five demons went out of her following him. And these people are living this transformed life from their past because they're following him. It's another example about the reality of Jesus, right? And so how is this story like the parable of the two sons? You remember the parable of the two sons? So one son, the, the father says to the son, the son, go into the vineyard and work, and then come back at the end of the day. And the son goes, yes, dad, I'll go, and he doesn't go. And then the second son does the same thing, and then the son says, no, I'm not going, and then he walks away. But then he feels bad, and he goes. So which son is which? So the son says, yes, dad, I'm going, and doesn't go is the Pharisee, okay? The one who says, no, Dad, I'm not going, but then goes, is actually the tax collectors and the prostitutes, right? And what does Jesus say about those two groups of people? I will read it to you in red. Which of the two did his father will? The first they answered, that's the tax collector. They, they just indicted themselves again, the Pharisees. And then here, after they indicted themselves, Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors, the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. John came to you, John the Baptist, to show you the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him. The tax collectors, prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. So how did the apostle Paul come to follow Jesus despite having the same training and thoughts as Simon the Pharisee? Well, what do you remember? He says in 1 Timothy, he goes... This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the number one sinner in chief. That's the exact opposite of sight, right? What is Paul's great epistle or letter of forgiveness? So you wanted to teach somebody forgiveness, which epistle is all about forgiveness? It's the famous book you love to read, and it's only like one chapter. Thank you. It's Philemon. It's all about forgiveness. So if you read about Philemon, it's very interesting that Paul says, if he owes you anything, put it on my account, even though you owe me that I gave you the gospel and you know Christ. But if you could put it on my account, and so just like Jesus, if you don't forgive people's debts, you owe a great debt, right? So that's Philemon in the setting of great forgiveness and that faith was recognized by Philemon. And here it is. Forgiveness, true forgiveness is costly. To forgive a Onesimus would take the cost upon himself. Paul acts like Christ offering to pay the debt 
And God took the cost of forgiveness upon himself at the cross, and Philemon can forgive in light of the cost God has paid. All right, so what is the principle? Great love comes from great forgiveness, and who gave the great love and forgiveness was God. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? And the greater the forgiveness, the greater love. Okay, now we can all stand, and we're going to sing a song.